Um, as I looked over the, the lectionary uh, offerings for this week, which were in the bulletin last week, um, I read through them, and this phrase kept coming to my head when I looked upon the short text we have for us in Luke chapter 17. That phrase was a little dabble, do ya? Now, does anybody here remember the original product that was for? Be honest now. Brill cream. Yeah. A little dabble, do ya? But if you use too much, this is what happens. <laughs> More is not always necessarily or even better. And that is true for brill cream. It's true for any small amount that you dab on, whether it's a paste or a cream or an ointment. But we also know that you use more than the little dab, and it could be detrimental, especially if you're dealing with hot sauce in Mexico. It's a normal human tendency for us to think that's that more of something will be better. And Jesus' disciples were certainly no exception to that philosophy. In that short passage we find in Luke, we find Jesus in an encounter with his disciples, and he has already dropped some heavies on them in the first four verses of chapter 17. But we pick it up in verse 5, where the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Jesus replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. In her Sunday musings this week, author and professor and speaker Diana Butler Bass muses on three words. Increase our faith. And she goes on to say that those three words got her thinking about what she coined three-word theology. And she began to think about three-word theology, three words that capture theology in the New Testament. And she put together this list. God is love. Love your neighbor. Here am I. Be not afraid. Peace on earth. Love one another. Do unto others. Faith, hope, love. Pray like this. Go, do likewise. God will provide. Love is patient. Love your enemies, 70 times 7, thy kingdom come, love never fails. And she says, honestly, who needs volumes of systematic doctrine when we have such concise wisdom at hand? Three-word theology is deceptively simple, but it isn't shallow.
the would-be disciples in our text this morning feel the weight of the world's brokenness. And they wonder how the work will get done. And we could think about the brokenness of our own world, the world in which we live. And Clark has mentioned some of the disasters going on around the world. And we could list many more. We hear them every day on the news. And we wonder how. How can we meet those needs as Christ followers? And we ask, Lord, increase our faith. Some of us relinquish responsibility in the face of the task, and others take on more than they can manage. Some of us strive and labor, hoping that what we do will earn us a seat at the table of God. But Jesus says, when you have done all you were ordered to do, we are worthless slaves who have no need of payment, for we have done only what we ought to have done. Lord, increase our faith. Why did the apostles cry out, Lord, increase our faith? Because what Jesus was teaching was difficult. Because what Jesus was asking them to do felt overwhelming. Because in light of the needs and the challenges before them, they simply felt ill-equipped and underqualified. And Jesus slayed a few three-word theologies on them in those first four verses. In particularly, 70 times 7. I don't know about you, but I can relate. I can relate. Lord, increase my faith. Increase our faith, the disciples asked. Increase my faith, I ask, in some form or another nearly every day. What does Jesus say in response? No. He says no. Why? Why would Jesus say no to something like that? And maybe the only way that we can answer that question is to unpack what we mean by faith. What exactly are we asking for when we beg God to give us more faith? Sometimes I'm asking for the faith that moves mountains. A supernatural ability to, to manipulate God into doing what I want. As honest and as, as genuine as that request may be. Sometimes I'm asking for an intellectual booster shot, an increased mental capacity to affirm the more challenging tenets of traditional Christianity, the virgin birth, the resurrection, the second coming. And sometimes I'm asking for an antidote to anxiety. God, please take away the fear I feel. Take away the fear as I, as I face your invisibility and your silence. Grant me certainty so, so I'll feel happier and holier and stronger and braver. Rewire my brain and my heart so that it becomes impossible to doubt you. When I take a hard look at my assumptions about faith, Jesus' no begins to make some sense. Because let me ask a question. What if faith, what if faith isn't measurable? What if faith isn't measurable? What if more faith isn't better faith? 
What if faith isn't even a noun? What if instead faith is engagement? Faith is orientation. Faith is action. What if faith is something we do, not something we have? Whenever I read the Gospels, I'm struck by how often and how lavishly Jesus commends the faith of those who seek him out. Your faith has saved you, he tells a woman who anoints his feet. A Samaritan leper who returns to thank him and a hemorrhaging woman who grasps his cloak, your faith has made you well, he tells a blind beggar. Such faith I have not seen in all of Israel. He exclaims about a Roman centurion. What is it that Jesus admires in these people? As far as I can tell, the only thing that they do is turn to him. They orientate themselves in his direction. They trust him. What earns his admiration is their willingness, even in difficult, painful, and potentially risky circumstances, to lean into his goodness, his healing, his justice, his mercy. If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, Jesus says to his disciples, as as if to say, you do. You do. Don't you understand? You have faith already. This is not about proportion. I can't give you a recipe for faith. Jesus is saying. We're not balancing chemical equations with a neutron here and two protons there. You have faith because you have me. You've seen me. And know in me. What else do you lack? Perhaps the invitation in our text this morning is for us to go forth and to live in light of what we already see, what we already sense, what we already hear and know. In other words, the invitation is to do faith, to do faith, to do the loving forgiving thing that we consider so ordinary, we ignore it. Why? Because the life of faith is as straightforward as a slave serving his master dinner. As ordinary as a hired worker returning and fulfilling the terms of his contract. Faith is in fireworks. It's not meant to dazzle. Faith is simply recognizing our tiny place in relation to God's enormous creative love and then filling that place with our whole lives. And in this sense, and I know how unpopular it sounds, Faith is simply showing up when we're expected to show up. Faith is duty motivated and sustained by love. Sixty plus years in the church. I still firmly believe this, that one of the most damaging messages that the church communicates to people 
struggling in their spiritual lives is that faith is somehow adverse to doubt and fear and ambivalence or confusion. That when it comes to faith, our problem is scarcity. I've heard that message preached and taught in churches throughout my entire life. And I ask, is this not cruel? Is this not deeply damaging? Having faith, even having enough faith, does not mean that we will never struggle with unbelief or distrust, or anxiety. Having faith means leaning hard into God's abundance. Having faith means pursuing God and the things of God even when the pursuit feels painful or even pointless. Faith is not deciding once and for all to follow Jesus. Faith is living, living within God's extravagant decision to love and pursue us. Faith is trusting Jesus one step at a time. Day by day by day by day. For the long haul. One author writes that we waste a great deal of time and energy looking for the key to the treasure box of more. All we lack, she argues, is the willingness to imagine that we already have everything we need. only thing missing, the only thing missing is our consent to be where we are, present with the presence of God. Those famous words of G.K. Chesterton suggest when he wrote and suggested that the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. The Christian ideal has not been tried and found found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. And if I'm honest, I must admit that when I ask God to increase my faith, what I'm really asking for is a spiritual life that's easy, smooth, and uncomplicated. Jesus' response to his disciples, however, suggests that faith requires rigor, and it grows stronger when it's exercised and weakens when it's idle. In other words, Jesus doesn't sidestep the disciples' request for faith out of callousness. He sidesteps it out of wisdom and deep love. Why? Because he knows. He knows the thing that makes for human flourishing. He recognizes the muscular living our hearts require in order to thrive. And according to Jesus, all we need All we need is the faith of a mustard seed. It's pretty tiny. Pretty tiny. 
tiny little seed's worth of faith is enough to produce much faith, much fruit. A little dab of faith will do you. It's enough to see us through. By the winds of the Holy Spirit, God will equip, God will inspire and send us to do what we're called to do to serve the world in the name of Christ because we have been loved. We have been fed and saved by a gracious and amazing God. So relax, breathe, quit fretting. We need to give ourselves permission to mess up. Because even if we do, and we will, God will be right there to get us back up on our feet so that we can try again. It's not a question of needing more faith, so I don't do that. Exercise it. We don't need much more faith or greater faith or bigger faith. We just need to exercise the faith that we have. No matter how paltry, no matter how pitiful we might think it is, the amazing, amazing, amazing thing is is that God is in the business of maximizing the small broken bits and the pieces of ordinary everyday faithful folk. Go into the world and share this amazing good news. For as Teresa of Avilia has so beautifully written, Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on the world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Do faith. And faith will increase. Do faith. And the astonishing fruits of faith will reward you. Let us pray. When injustice looms large, remind us that small daily gospel obediences reveal the infinite wideness of your mercy, O God. And strengthen all whose lives of daily justice bring grace into the world. When justice delays and nothing seems to change, remind us that faith and perseverance manifest God's unchanging love and inspire all whose long-term faithfulness slowly heals the world. And when the call of your reign is difficult and daunting, Remind us that life is found in giving ourselves for you and for others and sustain all whose constant sacrifices bring joy and goodness to the world. O oh God, through our faith, though our faith is mustard seed small, we offer it to you that we may daily play our little part in your saving transforming purposes. Amen.